So, uh, so I'm Jeremy. I'm Jonathan. Uh, we work on machine learning tools and libraries for recommendation science at Netflix, and we're going to talk about Polynote today. So what is Polynote? Uh, it's a polyglot <laughs> notebook environment uh, that we built from scratch. And how many people here have used a notebook tool of some kind? Oh, most of you. Wow, that's great. OK. Uh, so for anybody who hasn't, a notebook is like a document which contains code and the result of ex executing the code. Uh, it's useful for da data science uh, exploration, experimentation, uh, among other things. And some uh, examples of this that you might have used or heard of are Jupyter, uh, Zeppelin, Mathematica, uh, among other tools. Uh, so given that these other tools exist, why did we build uh, Polynote? And we noticed at Netflix that uh, on our team, our scientists were kind of avoiding using scholarly notebooks uh, for their experimentation. And instead, they would rather use Python-based notebooks uh, and this is a problem for us because our infrastructure is largely based on Java and Scala. Um, so it's easier to productize an experiment uh, if it's already using our Scala platform and, and libraries. Uh, if if it's, instead the experiment was done with Python, uh, then it's very easy to lose something in translation uh, when you're uh, productizing that uh, in Scala. And the reason they were avoiding that is because it was just a pain to use uh, Scala uh, and Spark in a notebook. Uh, so researchers would, would go back to Python or they would avoid notebooks altogether, uh, which is a shame because uh, that, that kind of tool has a lot to, to offer uh, when you're iterating on an experiment. So some of the pain points that, that uh, our team was having uh, is autocomplete is really kind of a necessity uh, when you're working with Scala, at least much more so than, than Python, it seems. Uh, there's uh, compiler errors that can be difficult to find in a notebook when all it tells you uh, is, is a line number that doesn't even always correspond to the actual uh, location of the error in the, in the cell. Um, uh, dependencies, there's a lot more dependencies uh, with Scala projects, and so sometimes our, our researchers can end up having uh, you know, dozens of translated dependencies uh, when they bring in our platform. Um, and uh, the dependencies you bring in can actually clash with Spark's own dependencies if you're using Spark. Uh, so that means you have to shade all your dependencies, and our researchers were just spending a lot of time building shaded jars, and that's time they could be spending innovating instead. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of, of history on, what, on how this project came around, uh, our original idea was to build a notebook tool on top of uh, IntelliJ idea, uh, the idea being that you know, IntelliJ would give you all the great editing features that it has, and the notebook's just built on top of that. Um, we made a few uh, attempts at that. Uh, we'll talk about why that didn't work out. Um, so I found myself still, you know, it, it, uh, late last year I found myself still grumbling about this problem uh, that we were having. Uh, and I kind of had a put up, put up or shut up moment where I said, you know, if you think, you know, it shouldn't be so hard to do this, maybe you should just try to do it and see how hard it is. Uh, so I sort of started building this, this proof of concept as a side project. Then I shared it with a couple of the researchers and they said, hey, this is great, you should share it with some more. And so uh, it slowly started picking up uh, steam. Uh, so I kept on plugging at it. And then uh, early this year, uh, Netflix decided to invest resources uh, in, this, in this project uh, in the form of Jonathan also working on it. Uh, so, uh, and at this point, like a lot of, a lot of researchers are actually using this, this tool to do, to do real work. Uh, and so, uh, uh, thanks to our, our boss, Faisal, for investing uh, or, or taking the gamble on actually uh, getting behind this as a, as a, as a product. And then, uh, the, uh, a couple months ago, we announced this thing as open source. It's kind of been stealth open source the whole time, uh, but uh, at that point, we felt uh, comfortable sort of exiting stealth mode and announcing it. Uh, so I want to talk about some of the things we learned from the failures and successes we had in this, in this project. Uh, and he, uh, the first thing is, why not ID, IDE-based? So I mentioned that the original idea was to do like an, an IntelliJ plugin. Uh, so why, why not just build a, a plugin like that? And, and the, the problem is the notebook has a lot of uh, rich sort of document-like uh, content. And the only standardized pre-baked mechanism to display all of that stuff is basically HTML. Um, so you can either support HTML output or you can restrict sort of the richness of uh, what, the, what the notebook can output. Uh, and that means either embedding HTML into your UI or embedding your UI into HTML. And for us, it turned out to be easier to do the latter. Um, 
you know, it's not easy to have a feature complete HTML implementation on the JVM. Um, you know, there's JavaFX sort of the state of art, the art for that, but it doesn't come close to what, what Chrome or Firefox uh, can display. Um, so, and actually, JetBrains has their own IntelliJ based notebook, big data notebook product. Uh, I haven't looked at that, but uh, it sounds pretty cool, so check that out. All right, so uh, we use Jupyter a lot at Netflix, and actually, we invest in Jupyter a lot as well. So, why don't we just build a Jupyter kernel uh, and reuse the rest of that ecosystem? And uh, it's something that we thought about doing, uh, and actually, the, the Almond kernel had just renamed itself when we first started on this project uh, from Jupyter Scala to Almond. And it's come a long way since then, and it's really st uh, stable and it's great. Uh, but the kernel turned out to be only part of the problem for our use case. Um, and the problem was a lot of the features that we wanted, you know, they could have possibly been implemented as Jupyter extensions, uh, but Jupyter's model isn't really equipped to efficiently support some of these things, and we'll talk about what those features are. Uh, because the, in Jupyter, the document state is all client-side. So uh, everything that's happening in Jupyter is basically happening in your browser, except every time you want to run code, you send the code to the server, and it executes the code, and it tells you the result. Uh, but the state of the document itself is all tracked uh, exclusively in your browser. Um, so if, if you want to auto-complete some code, for example, that means Jupyter's got to send the entire content of that cell to the server, and then the server's going to tell you, uh, you know, figure out what to complete at the spot that you asked for and tell the client about it. And that's like, you know, an extra 300 milliseconds of latency can get pretty noticeable uh, when you're trying to do interactive autocomplete, which is what we wanted to do. Um, there's some other problems with that. For example, like what happens if you start running a notebook that takes 10 hours and then you close your laptop to go home? Uh, uh, in vanilla Jupyter, that means everything is lost. Uh, and uh, when you get home, your notebook's not uh, really running anymore. Uh, so we, what we wanted was a model where uh, the document lives on the server and only edits are sent back and forth. Um, and it turns out that when you use a model like that, you get some other cool things like collaborative editing uh, of the notebooks, more or less for free. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan, and he's going to uh, show you what makes Polynode a little different from other notebook tools that you may have seen. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so I'll be talking about some of these features that really makes uh, Polynode shine and uh, what's different about it from some of the other solutions that we have for notebooks. Um, so we'll dive right into talking about editing improvements. So like Jeremy mentioned, uh, we wanted to bring some of these uh, IDE features like autocomplete, <coughs> program variants, and nice uh, red squigglies on errors um, over to the notebook world. Um, so here we have a video where I'll attempt to show what it's like to kind of just edit in Polynote. So I'll just start typing uh, some stuff here, and I'll play around with the, just a current hash map just to show the interactive autocomplete that comes in. Um, and uh, this editor right here that you see inside that I'm typing in is actually using Monaco, which is um, open sourced by Microsoft, the same uh, editor that powers VS Code. They open sourced it, so you could just throw this into any kind of web page that you have, it's really nice. Um, so, you know, here we see the parameter hints, um, so maybe a little bit rough, but um, it's kind of nice to be able to see that as you're writing. And uh, great, we just uh, got some stuff. Um, and now I'll generate a, kind of a syntax error, and we'll see what that looks like. And uh, we see that we get a nice little red squiggly there, and it tells us what line is here. So in a little example like this, of course, it's a bit trivial, but if you can imagine a very large notebook cell with some missing, you know, comma or something somewhere in the middle. It's a real pain when you get that in uh, Jupyter or Zeppelin and it just says, it says at the bottom, like, oh, yeah, I don't know what to do. <laughs> Good luck trying to find that. Um, so it's nice, it's nice to get this here. Uh, and finally, we have a, a, a WYSIWYG editor um, up at the top. So rather than uh, forcing you to kind of write markdown and then kind of, you know, press enter to run the markdown, um, we just have our little WYSIWYG editor here. And uh, it also uh, supports LaTeX, which uh, I'm showing, but not. Uh, well, I'm telling you, but I'm not showing you how to do it. Um, finally, uh, sorry, not finally, but uh, another thing is reproducibility. Um, so we, uh, we, when Jeremy asked uh, you all if you have used a notebook before, I saw a lot of hands, which is great. How many of you have tried to use a colleague's notebook only to find that it didn't actually run? 
Yeah, so something happened, right? So uh, cells were executed out of order, um, something got deleted or modified, and so you ended up with this notebook that someone shared and said, oh, I solved it here, use this, and it doesn't actually work, it won't run from the top. Um, and uh, the, this happens to us all the time, and it's, you know, as you can imagine, it's a like, kind of large organization of researchers and data scientists. Uh, it'd be nice if we can share notebooks a bit more uh, reliably. And um, the problem here is that, like in a traditional notebook, um, a notebook gives you this UI where you see like a whole bunch of states at once uh, across time, uh, but they're backed by this REPL that only understands the next command that you run, no matter what cell it came from. Um, and so, like Jeremy, Jeremy mentioned earlier, the big thing about Polynote is uh, that we, we keep track of the state of the notebook. Um, and so essentially that means it's not a REPL. Um, so <coughs> there's no hidden state, um, which means another hidden state problem. Um, so here's a quick example of that. Um, so I'll you know, just run, set this variable to, uh, to one, then we'll print it out, hooray, set it to two. Okay, so uh, now if I'm gonna run this cell two again here that prints foo, what would we expect the output of, foo, of that um, cell to be? Okay, well if you're used to Jupyter, you'd expect it to be two because we just ran this setting foo to two. Um, but in Polynote, it stays at one. Um, and just to prove that I actually did run it, um, I'll just you know run it, make sure it you know, takes. Right? <laughs> uh, it's still one. All right, what's going on? So, um, so essentially, in, in Polynote, uh, because we have uh, the whole, we keep track of the, the notebook. Um, the position of a cell inside a notebook is kind of like first class. So um, we know that this is cell two. Cell two is uh, under cell one, so the only input uh, state that's available to that cell is um, the value foo equals one at top. So you can do whatever you want to foo underneath, it's not gonna affect it. Um, and so the idea is just like, every, you make mod modifications to the notebook and you work with it, but it should still work and run from the top. Um, let's say we did wanna change foo, of course we'll let you do that, just insert a cell and then overwrite foo to whatever you want it to be. Um, and then that'll work. Uh, and of course, uh, if you delete the cell, we're back to one. Um, and so we found that the, uh, these changes here uh, help uh, improve the reproducibility of notebooks um, without kind of getting too much into the in, in the way. Um, so now we'll talk about visibility. Um, what do we mean by that? Visibility basically uh, refers to like getting to know what's actually going on in this kernel. Like, uh, uh, when you're running some cells in a notebook. So in, in other uh, tools, you like run a bunch of cell, you get a little asterisk next to the cell and it says, hey, I'm running, <coughs> leave me alone, I'll tell you when I have some output. Um, but we wanted to kind of give you a little bit more information about what's, what's going on. So we've got this um, symbol table, task list, and uh, we highlight the executing expression, uh, which I'll show here. So um, don't bother reading too much. This code is just an example, uh, just to showcase this. Uh, but essentially, I'm just, I'm just going to run this through, and then I'm going to, we'll kind of go over it. Um, but I'm just going to run all the cells, and uh, we'll see the execution output there. Great. All right, so let's uh, go back to the beginning and kind of go through this step by step. Um, so first thing, all right, so uh, first thing we can see that, all right, this green cell is what's running. Uh, these gray cells are queued. We even see the queue order here. Um, <coughs> which seems trivial, but you don't get it in Jupyter. Uh, and uh, we also get um, a progress bar. So, you know, we're on line two, so it, uh, out of 10, so it's kind of two out of 10, um, uh, like 20% 20, 20 done. And we also have um, a highlight on this, so I'll press play and we can see the highlight move down. Um, if you run a spark, uh, I'll give it a little bit. Um, if you run a Spark job, uh, we give you a little bit more information here, like, okay, great, it's doing a reduce, uh, and this is the stage, so if you have a multi-stage Spark job or something a bit complicated, you'll get more um, progress bars there, and it'll update. Um, and uh, and um, so that's, so this one, this here was a task list, and then um, that was the execution highlight. Uh, next, uh, we'll talk about this here, which is the symbol table. Um, right now we only see um, the Spark session, which is a global that we kind of provide for you. Um, but it, when, uh, in, a, in a second, I'm gonna click on this cell and uh, we'll see that change. Okay, so we see these, uh, this bar appeared and now we have the two variables that were defined in the cell are above the bar. That means they're the outputs, uh, output variables. 
and uh, everything below the bar is an input. And so, for example, if we click on cell two, we see that these guys moved into the input section, uh, and now Y is the output. Um, and so this lets you keep track of the state uh, that's available uh, to every cell. Um, and that's how, you, that's how you know like where you are in, in the notebook. Um, so we feel like this, uh, these UX improvements go a long way to helping you feel like you're understanding what's going on and you're kind of in control um, of, your, of what your notebook is. Um, so what's the poly in PolyNote? Um, uh, basically, you might have noticed uh, in some of the previous examples that there was a little drop down that said Scala uh, on uh, every single cell. Um, that's kind of a good hint that, um, that we can change the language for every cell. Um, and so we support, right now we support Scala, Python, and SQL cells, where SQL is basically Spark SQL. Um, but we're happy to add more languages as the use cases come up. Uh, and essentially you can have a, you know, a polyglot notebook and you can share variables between uh, the different languages. Um, so here's an example um, where we uh, basically uh, define some data here in Scala and then we're gonna share it to Python and plot with matplotlib. And uh, believe it or not, this is basically one of the major use cases uh, for why, why um, a lot of the researchers and Netflix use Python for everything because they want to use Matplotlib. So here we solved it for them and now they can, uh, we can get them to use Scala for the interesting stuff and leave the plotting to Python. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll run this uh, real quick and uh, we'll see that basically we have this uh, data val over here and, um, and, the da and that data val is this one over here. So basically this guy came from here to here. And um, note that we had to, we kind of convert this to array, which kind of uh, shows you a little bit um, of information under the hood here. So this isn't, you know, some super uh, magical thing. Um, we use an awesome library called JEP, which stands for Java Embedded Python, which runs an embedded uh, CPython uh, interpreter in Java through JNI. Um, and that's doing the translation back and forth. Um, but Python is still Python, Scala is still Scala, right? So we, if we, you know, would give uh, Python a Scala list, uh, it's not really going to not, it's not really going to know what to do with that. Um, you won't be able to do like a nice indexing um, and, and splicing like like uh, like that here. So we make it an array. Array, everybody knows what an array is. Um, and so basically, what this means is uh, you can interrupt, um, but if you need to do anything special, like Scala specific, like multiple parameter lists or implicits stuff that Python has no idea about, um, you're gonna have some trouble. Um, but, uh, but like 90% of the use cases is kind of like do something with data and then give it to, give it to the other language um, where we, we find that you know, the uh, kind of more primitive uh, interop is, has worked well. Um, so we think that's one of the more interesting and powerful features of Polynome. Um, finally, uh, I keep saying finally, uh, maybe blame the jet lag. Um, so dependency and configuration management, um, we save this in the notebook metadata. Um, so unlike in uh, some other notebook tools, uh, you have to like have a magic cell right in the, like the first cell of the notebook has to add the dependencies or you have to do some magic like percent add depths or, or something like that. Um, instead, what we, we have just a little uh, kind of panel here um, where you can set some dependencies and this gets saved in the notebook metadata. Um, so we can set um, Maven coordinates like this. Um, you can set your IV or Maven resolvers here. Um, and again, we have a, a pip um, packages and, and pip, pip repos here as well for Python. Um, you can even put little exclusions here. And uh, there's a few benefits. Uh, and we use Corsair under the hood to do all the um, dependency resolution. Uh, there's a couple benefits here. Um, like as, uh, first off, as Jeremy mentioned uh, earlier, we had this problem with all these shaded jars that uh, our researchers would be spending a long time you know, making these uh, shaded jars, running them, things don't work because of guava and all that stuff. Uh, so uh, this lets us kind of, you know, you can iterate through your notebook, add some dependencies, and um, it's kind of more natural and you don't have to have a whole Gradle project somewhere where you make, put dependencies just to run it in a notebook. Um, and uh, second, saving it in the notebook file me makes it more portable. Uh, and, 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 aside, and, and, and in addition to that, um, saving in the notebook file means that we can generate notebooks as well. So we're, we're kind of only in the beginning of this kind of thing, um, but we actually have been able to integrate um, Polynote notebooks with some of our other internal tools, 
where, uh, for example, we might have some scheduler that runs some job, and uh, we have a little button there where you can click, downloads a notebook, a Polynote notebook, that has like the exact jar that was running in the job, and uh, has a few cells pre-filled to say like, take a look at the data that you generated, like just drops you into that environment. Um, and you know, making uh, the dependencies just in the JSON um, metadata is just way easier than having to teach the scheduler that you have to do percent add depths, like something dash dash something else. Um, and finally, uh, we have the Spark config here. So uh, you don't have to do like a spark.properties file in a magic spot in your file system in order to get this to work. Um, and okay, finally for real now, uh, data visualization. Uh, so we've got some uh, uh, data inspector uh, features like to allow you to browse tabular data and inspect schema of uh, uh, some like nested data and collections. And uh, we also have a plot editor that supports Vega and I already showed you not plot with um, so this is a two-part example, so I'm gonna skip uh, this bit for now, scroll down to the bottom and show uh, some like nested and uh, stru uh, structured data, um, which also supports nesting. There's no nesting here though. So we just got, you know, we have a case class, stick it in a collection, and here we can see, uh, we, can, we can take a look at the schema of that, um, that collection here, and you can imagine that for like a more complicated, arbitrary kind of nested data structure, which we use quite frequently, um, it's kind of useful to be able to click around to it. All right, so now we'll go up to the data viz. We've got this uh, nonsense here that just makes a nice graph. Um, and we can kind of tab through that data that was generated uh, in order to see that, yes, indeed, it's a bunch of ints and floats. Uh, and what we'll do now is plot it. Um, and we've got this little drag and drop plotting thing here where you can um, basically set what you want the axis to look like. And I'll drag it over and then we'll plot it. Um, and so this runs a Spark job in the background that's actually gonna do the computation um, and generate our nice little graph over there. <laughs> and then uh, what you can do with this graph is you can you know, look at it if you want. You can also save it into your notebook um, as a cell. And it's like a special cell type that has a Vega spec. So Vega is this visualization grammar that has a JSON specification. Um, so basically you could put like any JSON, any Vega JSON in here and we'll, we'll plot it for you. Uh, and we, have, we also have this uh, little uh, um, extension here that uh, this, this part here does the actual um, aggregation uh, of this out variable, which is the output of the previous cell. And that's how we link um, kind of the, the data uh, in your notebook and, and plot it. Um, so that's been a rolling tour of Polynote's features, and now back to Jeremy to talk about uh, some of our learnings building it. Yeah, so, uh, so this tool kind of went from zero to a working proof of concept uh, in just a couple of weeks in my spare time. Uh, and since then, uh, you know, we had we had it working to a degree where uh, our researchers were using it to do real work every day uh, in, a, in a pretty short short amount of time. Um, so, you know, not to toot our own horn too much, but uh, I think it has a good amount of functionality for the investment in person hours. Uh, I'm pretty proud of, of how, how, you know, rapidly we were able to do that. So I wanted to talk about, a little bit about uh, the process of building and some of the things we learned, uh, mistakes we made, uh, in case those things are useful to anybody. So the first trick, obviously, is not a secret. Uh, uh, stand on the shoulders of giants, right? So we built this on the back of some really amazing open source uh, tools. Uh, Monaco, as Jonathan mentioned, we're using for the editor there. Uh, the server is based on HTTP4S and FS2, which uses cats and cats effect. Um, uh, we're a relatively early adopter of Zio. Uh, we're using Skodek for our, our protocol and uh, Corsier for dependency management. We use Cersei for parsing configuration, and uh, Jonathan mentioned JEP and some other uh, uh, open source uh, libraries. Without which, this wouldn't have been uh, so so easy to do. Um, and uh, I found the ecosystem uh, in incredibly rich and surprisingly mature. So it had been a while since I had. Uh, uh, done the sort of full stack dev kind of thing. I mainly work on uh, machine learning tools and libraries. Um, so I was just really impressed at how 
easily I could pick up these little pieces and put them all together and you know within uh, the span of a few hours I had a working server with web sockets and everything uh, and then whenever we had questions uh, the community was just really welcoming and helpful I probably uh, each one of those projects, I probably went into their Gitter channel at some point and bugged them with stupid questions and everybody was just uh, really helpful. Uh, so all of those people made Polygon impossible. Um, so another takeaway, I think, is don't be afraid of, of functional programming. So this, this was written uh, using FP with effects from the start. Like I mentioned, we're using HTV4S with cats, cats effect uh, FS2. Um, and at this point, I was the only person who had worked on it. So. Um, how many, how many people use functional programming at work? Oh, everybody, okay, great. Uh, how, many people would, how many people would probably go deeper into it uh, if they didn't have to worry about whether their team would be able to uh, follow their code? Yeah, so I think this is, a, uh, uh, this is an assumption that we sometimes make, uh, which is, you know, anybody that hasn't used functional programming before, the first thing they're gonna do when you leave is rewrite it and remove all your Pisley fish and your product write and uh, all your other uh, fun functional things. Um, and I was kind of worried about that when, when Jonathan uh, said he was interested in working on Polynote, I was kind of worried, is he gonna look at the code base and run screen in the other direction? Because he hadn't, uh, he hadn't really done uh, functional programming kind of stuff before. Um, so uh, this is at least one data point for that assumption, which is maybe it's not always true. Uh, because he got in there and he was productive immediately uh, on the code base. Um, so I wanted him to maybe talk about that from his perspective a little bit, the onboarding thing. Um, so, like, like Jeremy was saying, this is my first time working with effects and monads on this project. Like about, it's been about a little bit less than a year now. Um, I wasn't new to Scala. I was uh, working on a project that was written in Scala, but it was using Scala kind of like a, you know, kind of like Kotlin, kind of like a better Java kind of thing. Um, not really with the whole, you know, IO monads and, and that sort of uh, kind of Scala we're talking about more today and tomorrow. Um, and I, I actually had looked at um, into CATS for that previous project, um, but I, I have to admit that I was intimidated just by looking at the website. Um, so you see like this kind of thing, and you kind of say, like, what is that? Uh, <laughs> so all that jargon, all that like category theory kind of, oh yeah, free applicatives, what, what, what am I going to do? <laughs> do I need that? What is it good for? Uh, so all that jargon is really overwhelming. Um, and, but what I found uh, now that uh, basically uh, being forced to work with this, uh, uh, I found that uh, basically you don't need to be an expert on category theory to be productive with FP. Um, and the way I was able to do that, and of course it might differ for other people, but uh, just not getting bogged down in the details. So it's kind of okay to, that you don't understand how every single thing works end to end when you first get started. Um, so what I did was I kind of said, okay, like I have a bug to fix or a feature to make. I have to understand this thing here and the rest is kind of magic. Um, and over time, this magic section uh, gets smaller and smaller as you work on different parts of the code base. Um, and of course it helps to you know, have somebody who knows what they're doing, um, who built a good foundation there, so you can have, kind of see like, uh, how is this actually supposed to be used in the real world and not like, on a website. Uh, not to say that I mean, the websites are actually uh, good, I really like the docs, uh, especially the um, cats effect cartoons with the little cats who are like refs and stuff, it's really great. Uh, and, uh, it really does uh, help uh, make things a little bit more approachable when you have a little cartoon, it just kind of makes you feel like, oh, okay, somebody actually thought about this and is like, trying to explain it to me who doesn't know anything, so <coughs> it's good. Um, so like I said, this approach worked for me, uh, but it definitely leaves gaps in your knowledge. So it's definitely not the best way to make you sound smart at conferences, so I definitely won't sound very smart uh, if you ask me questions about FP. Um, but uh, yeah, and then don't, ask, don't hesitate to ask for help. Uh, you have to find somebody who you can totally interrupt all the time and uh, ask uh, stupid questions uh, like, uh, what's the difference again between that uh, followed by and that product right again? Like, well, what if I have an IO and then oh, what's going to happen? Um, and uh, I also cheated. My speaker notes definitely say followed by is that one and product right is the other one. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes, I do. 
appreciate the assertion that I know what I'm doing, although that's not. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we, like I said, we migrated to Zio, uh, or like we're kind of, a, I think, an early adopter of Zio. Um, and uh, so this thing started with 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 Cat's Effect, uh, which really uh, showed. Uh, at least I hadn't had the chance to structure a complete application end to end uh, with using uh, using Effectful. Uh, FP. So it, it, it was instructive to me how, how well uh, that could work to, to structure an application. Um, but then about seven months in, we adopted Zio. And the reason, the thing that attracted us to Zio originally was uh, the interruptible I.O. So we have, uh, I don't know if you noticed uh, on, the, on the UI when Jonathan was showing the demos, but we have a button to stop the current task that's executing. Uh, and when the user clicks that button, we really want to do everything we can to cancel whatever the cell is doing. Uh, and give them back uh, the notebook. Um, and Cat's Effect doesn't have something like that uh, out of the box for reasons of principle that I understand. Uh, they will not like go as far as to actually interrupt a thread uh, in order to, to cancel something, uh, which is something that we really, we really needed to, to be able to do that. We had a bunch of hackery around <coughs> Cat's Effect to make that possible. Um, and I heard that ZIO, or ZIO, sorry, uh, get used to the pronunciation. Uh, I heard that Zio uh, provided that for free uh, and basically uh, implemented that in such a way where there's no race conditions about is the fiber still on the thread or like, yada yada yada. Like we had a bunch of uh, terrible stuff uh, to try to make that happen and all of that could just get deleted, which is great because the best kind of code is the code you delete. Um, so that's really the, the thing that attracted us, us to it to begin with, but really the thing it, you know, if we came for the interruptible I.O., we stayed for the environment mechanism. Uh, so um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit uh, uh, in, in some more detail. And I think there's going to be some other talks uh, that go into even more detail about that as well. Uh, so it took a couple of tries to make this migration, and I wanted to touch <coughs> on how that is. And the reason is the first couple attempts, uh, we just tried to treat it like, like it was an F, you know, like it was uh, just another single whole type class. Um, or a single computer type. Um, and that, that's, uh, you know, we thought we had planned for uh, switching effect types um, because what we did was, well, we, when we wrote this application, we're like, hey, we might switch effect types at some point. Let's uh, make everything with these abstract Fs all over the place. Um, and that's, uh, don't get me wrong, it's probably still a good idea if you're writing a library uh, where you want people to be able to bring their own effect type. But for an application, I think it obs obscured the code a little bit. Uh, it sort of binds you to these, these type classes. It makes it a uh, uh, little bit awkward sometimes to, to uh, figure out which imports you need to do to be able to recover the syntax that you lost. Um, but the real problem uh, in switching to Zio was, like, there's three type parameters on Zio, and most of the interesting stuff is in those first two, right? So the things that make Zio uh, stand apart are the R and the E there. Um, and if you're abstracting over your effect type, all you get is the A. Um, you have to fix the other two. Uh, so that, uh, we kind of quickly found that that meant it wasn't easier to switch to Zio, at least if we wanted to, to use any of those things, which we actually had to because in order to get the uh, interruptible I.O., we needed to use the environment mechanism. And I'll, I'll mention why that is. Um, but, uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think it was actually harder to switch uh, because we had done all that abstraction. We kind of had to unwind all of that. Um, and uh, basically the, the successful attempt at, at migrating involved uh, a lot of rewriting uh, code, which was a lot of work, and I think it was totally worth it. Uh, because what happened while we were re rewriting it is uh, a lot of our terrible stuff went away because uh, of the way that ZI, uh, Zio allowed us to, to restructure it in a better way. So it was a lot of work to do it, but it was all work for the better, I think. Um, so I want to talk a little bit more about the environment, which is the R you see right here. Um, and I think, yeah, like I said, I think there'll be more talks about, about this in, in more detail. Uh, but the, the environment, uh, at least as, uh, the way we're using it, uh, is for sort of sharing dependencies with downstream effects. And, and dependencies could be configuration capabilities, anything that you might use uh, like a dependency injection framework um, for. So it's a powerful alternative, alternative to things like that, uh, like passing parameters around everywhere, uh, which we were doing a lot of before. 
um, you can go into our Git history and, and see uh, the change for the better if you don't believe me. Um, I mean, not that it's perfect now, but it's much better than it was. Um, and, and some people might say, oh, I'll, I'll make those parameters I'm passing around everywhere implicit, and then I don't have to mention them everywhere uh, at the call site, at least. Uh, but you still have to mention them at the definition site. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also these insane sort of runtime uh, dependency injection frameworks, which, uh, you know, if you like that sort of thing, I can't help you. Uh, and so, uh, and this has, uh, uh, the way this is designed uh, is pretty ingenious it, the, uh, from the type inference you can get. So let's say I have a first effect and a second effect. The first one requires thing one as a dependency, whatever that may be. The second one requires thing two as a dependency. And if I flat map the first to the second, it, the, the type system has already figured out that the resulting effect need, needs both. Uh, uh, thing one and thing two. And it, that's expressed as an intersection type like that, as you see, uh, thing one with thing two. Um, so uh, if you model the capability, if you model capabilities this way using the environment, uh, there's, an, there's a sort of object-oriented programming bonus to this, which is that you can make interfaces and, and methods in your interfaces can describe exactly what capabilities that method could have. Um, so I, I know that some method here re returns a ZO that has blocking and publish result uh, in, its, uh, in its return type. Uh, and those are two capabilities that now those are the only uh, capabilities that any implementation of this method can, can have access to. Um, so I think that's kind of a, an example of where Scala's mix of OO and, and FP really shines is that here we're making a sort of object oriented interface, but I know that uh, from, from the return type, from the type signature of the methods, exactly what that method is allowed to do, right? And that's uh, pretty useful, or at least I, I found it pretty useful. Um, so here's a, an example of a capability. This one's pretty much just lifted from, from Zio. It's uh, out of the box, just the, the console service. Uh, so you can see there's a trait. Uh, this trait has one abstract uh, value in it, which is a, of type console.service, and console.service is where uh, the methods that actually do console.io uh, exist. And uh, the, the trait console is just for the purposes of basically mixing this capability in with all the other capabilities. Um, and then you can sort of make the, the capability itself, the console.service part, you can make that sort of point free by pulling out some functions. Uh, and this is a really awesome refactor that you can do uh, with all of your capabilities that uh, you def your custom things you define. Um, you can just pull out a static method like this. Uh, so if I pull out uh, the get line and the put line, and do a static method that the return type depends on console, uh, then I can just call those static methods. And, I, and now this is point free, by which I mean we never have to talk about an instance of console.service, right? Uh, there's nowhere in there where I, have to, where I have to assign that to a value, um, which is, uh, uh, it's really nice because it's less noise in your code, sort of. Um, and then if I have these things, uh, in this example, I have a, a console service and a spam, or a console capability and a spam capability. Um, and in my for comprehension, I'm asking for your email, and then immediately I start spamming you, and the resulting effect, uh, uh, you can see, depends on both console and spam in the environment. Okay, so there's a little bit of a catch with this, um, which is that eventually you, you have to construct that big environment. Like it's an intersection of all these different capabilities, and that's a thing that's like a concrete value that is going to be used by Zio uh, to, to pass around. So you actually do have to construct one of those. Um, so for example, in this, uh, in here, I, let's say I have to load the configuration, and I need the configuration in order to construct the spamming capability. Uh, like maybe there's the email server within the configuration or something. Um, so in order to construct that, I have to load the config first, which means now I have to get the console thing out, I have to get the spammer after I construct it, and then I have to build this new console with spam where I assign those things, and then I have to finally provide that uh, to the send spam function. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, a little bit annoying for a couple reasons that I'll, I'll talk about. Um, with the time we've got. 
so our solution to this was to, to create a macro. Uh, we can just type class enrich, and an instance of enrich a b can take an a and a b and return an a with b. Um, and the result is uh, now at least we're point free again. We don't have to talk about uh, the actual instance of the environment. Um, we don't have to create that big intersection. Like for if you have two capabilities, it's not so bad, but you can imagine that that would get pretty boilerplate. Um, and actually, I think Zio has a module included which does something similar to this uh, called Zio Macros. And to be honest, I haven't used that. Uh, by that time, we already had our solution in it. It works pretty well for Polynaut, but definitely check out uh, Zio Macros. Um, all right, so uh, another annoyance uh, that I had was uh, at least something that bothered me syntactically. Uh, if your application has a lot of layers, which Polynode has, has, has several layers which have different, you know, more capable environments as you go down the layers, um, you can end up having to provide your enriched environment to a bunch of downstream effects like that. And now we're not point free anymore, we've got the end there uh, because we have to have that so we can provide it to, all, to each of those uh, effects in turn. And it would be nice to get rid of those and clean up that comprehension a little bit. Uh, so what I wanted to be able to do is enrich the environment and provide that enriched environment to the entire uh, rest, to the entire continuation um, afterwards. Uh, and you could pull those three things out, like we could pull these out and make them one effect that does all three of those things and provide it just to that one. That's kind of letting the environment structure sort of dictate the structure of the program a little bit too much. Um, so the ZIO access is kind of like uh, uh, an embedded reader, and it's, it's also kind of like half of index state, you know, like the, the get half of index state. Um, and so I guess kind of what, I would, what I'm asking for is like the other half, the modify uh, half of, of index state. Um, and to really go the, the, uh, the full index state route, it would need one more type printer for Zio. Uh, and you know, maybe three is a company, but four is definitely a crowd. So I'm not gonna advocate for adding another type parameter. Uh, but we, what, what, one solution we're trying is just to, to cheat a little bit, um, and this is gonna be an abomination, but uh, it gets the job done. So what, what, we, what we did is we have this, uh, this data type that just holds the environment, and then it's flat map, uh, com uh, gets the continuation, provides that to the continuation, and then returns the, Z the, the next Zio. Uh, so this is kind of a cardinal sin because it's not returning, it's got a flat map that's not returning the same data type. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, a little bit terrible, but it, you know, it cleans, it does basically what I wanted, it cleans everything up there a little bit. Um, and then we don't have to say provide anymore and we'll point free again. Uh, so there's that one. If we have, we have, a, we have a few more minutes, right? All right, one more little trick I wanted to talk about. Um, is how we're dealing with some implicit scope problems. So we use a type class in Polynote called Represelv. And what this does is whenever a, a, a result of type T is emitted by the notebook, uh, then Polynote will try to use the compiler to resolve an instance of Represelv for that, for that type. And this just tells us how to, you know, the different ways we could display that result to the user. Um, and we want people to be able to bring in reppers of it, like the reason we did it this way is so that it's extensible, right? You can hook into that, you can define your own instances of reppers of for your own uh, data types. Uh, but what we, we want to be able to let people like add a dependency which brings in reppers of for the other data types. Um, and that means we need some kind of solution, at least for the, the notebook, uh, to the orphan instance problem. And if anybody's not familiar with the orphan instance problem, here's kind of what it is. Let's say I have a library called need library, which has a data type. Um, and I want it to be able to resolve reppers of for that data type. Well, where's Scala going to look for that, uh, that instance? So it's going to look in reppers of's companion object. It's not going to find anything there unless we had depended on need library. Um, and then it'll look in Nido's companion object. It's not going to find it there unless uh, need library depended on polynote. Uh, and so what you have is you want to define a third library that depends on both of these things and provides those instances. Uh, and those are going to be orphaned because they can't be in either companion object. Uh, so they can't be in implicit scope and then the user of the notebook would then have to import these things into their notebook, uh, which is not ideal. 
Um, so here's what we're doing uh, to solve that problem for the notebooks at least, is we have a macro in Repro's companion object, um, which if there's no, uh, if there's no instance with higher priority, it'll get to this macro, it'll materialize, uh, or it'll get to this macro and it'll, that'll scan uh, the class path or it'll look for resources that have a certain name of this metadata file. And that those files contain the names of subclasses of Repro's um, and uh, if no instances are found with higher priority, it will uh, also search for those subclasses uh, to use as instances. And here's an example of that just to, to clarify uh, what I mean, uh, which is, oh, there's, there's a uh, mistake here. But um, So uh, if I have a, a, a another package called uh, polynote spark, for example, um, then I'll have, abstract, I'll have a class that extends represerve, and I'll have stuff in Spark represerve implicit scope. And then I've added Spark represerve to this metadata file. Um, and now everything in that companion object is also in implicit scope for represerve. Um, so that is kind of how we're handling that. We have five minutes left. All right, I'm gonna, we'll just stop here and uh, take some questions, I think. So there's the, the rest of this stuff uh, you can see in the video of this talk from Scale by the Bay. Uh, we got to do a lot of stuff uh, here that we couldn't, didn't have time for there. So uh, 